Good afternoon. Um, I'm David Ackerley, the newly installed Dean of the College of Natural Resources. I know many of you are here. I'm pleased to welcome you to the SJ Hall Lecture on Industrial Forestry. I'm a professor of plant ecology and my own research, a lot of it is on climate change and the impacts on forests. And I bet, like many of the people in this room, for me, this, the path to this started with a real love of just spending time in the woods. And for me, this was in my na native New England forests, in, especially in New Hampshire. I'm really looking forward to getting to know more of the forestry community here. Many of the alums, it's such an important part of the legacy of CNR and, of course, of our continuing mission and commitment going forward. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to give you some background on the lecture. And if you'll excuse me, I'm going to read from these notes so I actually get it right. I don't know this by heart. Keith might, if he was here. Um, and he will be here. Uh, the S.J. Hall Lecture is named for Sherwood J. Hall. Upon acquiring his, B, uh, his BS in forestry from New York State University, Syracuse in 1920, and this is where our speaker is from, Hall entered the forestry profession as a consultant in the South for the James D. Lacey Company, and in 1931 formed Forest Managers, Inc., where he both managed forests and advised other forest land owners. One of his clients was J.C. Penny, whom he aided in sculpting barren land into a forested home for a retirement center. Hall played a major role in the development of industrial forestry in the South before moving to the West in 1948, where he was one of the first to recognize the potential of the West Coast's young growth timber stands. Accordingly, Hall and his two partners acquired a 27,000 acre cutover redwood tract establishing the Gualala Redwoods Company. And that, of course, in that area, there's uh, a lot of activity continuing today in terms of the forest management in that region. The company quickly emerged as a leader in the industrial management of young growth redwood land, practicing sustained yield forestry. Upon Hall's death in 1968, his widow, Mrs. Desi Hall, moved to create the Forest Economics Foundation to advance the understanding and practice of sound economic principles among forestry students. Later that year, she established the S.J. Hall Lectureship in Industrial Forestry and the S.J. Hall Chair in Forest Economics, both here at UC Berkeley. Matthew Potts is the current S.J. Hall Distinguished Professor, and he's here with us this evening. He is a very fitting choice for the chair, someone who's deeply committed to understanding the relationships between forests and society in a very broad and global context. Hall felt strongly that economic understanding is basic to effective forestry and to a strong nation. And it's in keeping with that sentiment that we hold this annual lecture. Berkeley will be able to hold this event and continue to support our world-renowned programs in forest management and economics in perpetuity. And that, in large measure, thanks to the generosity and foresight of Desi Hall. This afternoon, I'd like to welcome and recognize members of the Hall family who have made it their tradition to participate in this annual event. Desi's daughter, Susan Hall, is here with us with her nephews, David and Ken Hall, and Ken's wife, Patty Dilko. Ken and David are grandsons of Desi Hall. So welcome, thank you for being here this year, and thank you for your family's support. A few quick announcements before I invite our speaker to the podium. Following the lecture, I invite you all to join us in, for a reception in the Ginkgo Courtyard. Go out the back of the room and just turn to the right. And after the public reception, uh, we'll have a private dinner for the California alumni forester members and their guests. And we ask the members and guests to move on to the garden room at the end of the reception. We'll show you where we are. And there'll also be a question and answer session uh, right after the talk. Uh, we'll have a couple microphones. We're recording the lecture to be able to put it online. Please wait for the micro microphones when you ask a question so we can capture it all and everyone can hear you as well. And please silence your cell phones, the necessary part of all introductions now. So I'm very pleased to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. David Nowak. He's a senior scientist and team leader with the USA Forest Service Northern Research Station in Syracuse, New York. His research investigates urban forest structure, health, and change, and its effect on human health and environmental quality. He has authored over 300 publications and leads teams developing the iTree software suite that quantifies the benefits of trees to society and especially in urban settings, as he'll talk about today. We're really pleased to welcome David home to Berkeley. He received his PhD from CNR in Wildland Resource Sciences in 1991, and we're always very pleased to have our own alumni come back to offer these featured, in these, in these featured speak, um, speaking series. So thank you very much for being here, and please help me in welcoming David to the stage. It's great to be here, thank you. 
Dean Ackerley, appreciate it, and thank you, Halls, for having me. I appreciate to be here. I actually graduated from Syracuse University, also the School of Forestry, with my bachelor's and master's. So I graduated, David said I graduated here in 1991, and there's a couple people with, after I left Berkeley, I worked for the Forest Service and have worked there continuously since 1991, moved back to Chicago and into Syracuse. And there's a couple of people I also want to thank, and one of them's here, my major professor, Joe McBride, who mentored me through there. I wouldn't be here if I weren't for him. And also Dr. Rowan Roundtree, who used to work for the Forest Service, was my mentor for the Forest Service here in Berkeley also. So those two men set my career. So when I left, my, my mission with the Forest Service is to understand urban forests. So we try to understand what are they, how are they changing, and what do they do for people? So my dissertation here at Berkeley, I studied the city of Oakland, California. We sampled throughout the city. I left and then I went to Chicago and we sampled the Chicago area, three counties around Chicago. Then I left and moved back to Syracuse in 1994 and we did the East Coast. We did four cities doing air quality studies. So at that point we said, we've got to automate the code to do this instead of just redeveloping projects every time. And in doing so, that led to what currently is now known as iTree. We've taken a system of trying to sample cities so that anybody can do that and then move it towards assessing ecosystem services. So you'll see, I'm going to show you a little about iTree today. But we've taken the research that we've been doing and trying to get it into the public hands, to school kids, to homeowners, to forest managers, and that's a lot of our work is working around iTree, which is built off of understanding the structure, how many trees do we have, and change. And then lastly, in the last couple of years, we moved into forest inventory within the Forest Service because the forest inventory that inventories our rural lands wants to use iTree to assess the values of our rural land forests also besides our urban forests. The 2014 Farm Bill was passed and allows the forest inventory to now do urban areas. So that map in the lower left here are all the cities that are currently being inventoried by the Forest Service where they're actually putting in permanent plots and monitoring change of forests within cities, which is the first time this has been done. Uh, in the world, we're actually having a monitoring system for forests. So what I'd like to talk to you today about is a little bit about iTree and about what we've learned over the past 20 or 30 years about urban forests in the United States, the benefits they provide and how they're changing. And lastly, I'll make a pitch of how urban forestry is going to be and urban influences are going to be very important on forest industry, seeing this lecture is about forest industry. To me, urbanization is a snake in the grass for rural forestry that you have to understand that it's going to come and have significant changes of how we manage our rural lands. So let me start with iTree. iTree is a public tool. You can go on your phone right now and get it. It's uh, to just Google iTree. What we've done, like I said, over the years, we've put all our computer systems into one package. And it's a series of free tools. It's forwarded by the Forest Service. You can see down at the bottom here, we have many partners on this. Davey, which is a private tree care firm, is one of our biggest partners. They actually invest money into this because they want to stimulate the care of trees. And the idea behind iTree is it allows people to assess trees at any scale from their backyards to whole forested stands to understand what they have and what values those trees are providing. The hope is by understanding the values of trees, people will manage the trees better. So what iTree is trying to do is integrate all these services into one spot because trees provide multiple benefits to society. So if we plant a tree, let's say for a carbon program, we are getting the carbon that we may want, but we're also getting air pollution removal, all these other benefits for the same price. And the problem with, at least from the federal system point of view is, a lot of our information is all over the place. I measure a tree and I want to learn about fire, I go over here. If I want to learn about wildlife, I go over there. I want to go carbon over here. It's, for the user's point of view, it's very inefficient. So we're trying to put it into one system which is very easy for people to use to get this information. iTree as a tool itself has been out since 2006. We currently have over a quarter million users worldwide. The tool can and is going global. It's mainly built for the United States. Uh, we have versions for Mexico we just released this year, Canada, Australia, the UK, and releasing a version for Europe in November, and working in Colombia and South Korea and New Zealand right now. <coughs> the concept behind the model is pretty simple. You measure an attribute about a tree, and you know the environment in which a tree exists, its weather system, its pollution system. You can simulate that tree, which we do on an hourly basis to do gas exchange and to simulate the services provided by the tree. The problem in going international is not the model itself, it's the data structures. When we go to Colombia or Brazil, everything's in a foreign language, where do we get the pollution data from? So we have to make local contacts to learn where their information is so we can bring it into the model. And there are tools to allow people to do that themselves for any city across the world. What do we calculate? 
We calculate air pollution removal. Basically, we look at gas exchange and interception by leaves based on hourly weather data and pollution data to look at air quality improvement and impacts on human health. We do the water cycle, look how trees affect water flow and water, er, water quality within cities or the area. We look at greenhouse gas reduction. Trees absorb carbon as they grow, we measure that. Building energy use and consequent emi altered emissions from power plants. If you plant a tree around a building, not only does it change the temperatures through transpiration and evaporative cooling, it shades the building, which alters the energy use. Is it always positive? No. In the northern climates, shading in the wintertime can increase energy use. So if you're in Florida, it's not a big deal. Everything's positive. You go to New York State, where I'm at, or Minnesota, you can often have negative energy consequences in the wintertime. So we need to understand that balance of what's happening, because trees, even out of leaf, shade buildings and shade uh, surfaces. We look at oxygen production, health benefits, UV radiation. Tree leaves absorb around 96% of ultraviolet radiation, which has impacts on skin cancer and human health. If a tree absorbs 96% of ultraviolet radiation, and you put it, you're in the middle of a field and you have a tree that's in full leaf and you're sitting in the shadow of that tree, what percent radiation do you think is being blocked by that tree? Or how much radiation do you think you're receiving? This is why we need to understand how the system works and designs. Anybody want to hazard a guess? You, it's about 50% is what is absorbed, or it, you get 50% reduction of UV radiation in the shadow of that tree. And why is that? Because not all the UV radiation, radiation is coming directly from the sunbeam. If you see blue sky, you're getting ultraviolet radiation. So if we want to design better designs in urban areas to protect kids and people who are exposed to sunlight, it's not about being in the shadow of the tree. It's about being blocking the total sunlight. So when you're enveloped in a forested stand, you're pretty much protected completely from UV radiation. In the shadow of one tree, you're not. More trees are better. So you need to understand the physics of how this is working so we can design better forests, particularly around people. The green ones at the bottoms are the one we're working on right now. We're working on cooler air temperatures and the impacts on human health, pollen, insect biodiversity, and forest products. So these are the tools that we have. Again, they're all free, they're available online. The core tool is ECO, and that's the tool that we use. If you want to sample anywhere in the world, ECO can work there. It's basically a, it's a plot-based or inventory-based system. So if I wanted to know how many trees are on the campus of Berkeley, I, I could inventory every tree. It might be inefficient. Or if I wanted to do all the state of California, I could put a plot system based out. What this tool does is once you put your area in, it'll tell you where to go. You can pick any size plot you want, any number you want. It'll put on Google Maps where to go, has a handheld data logger, which you set up on what fields you want to collect. You collect it on your phone. When you're done, submit the data to the server. Within an hour, because it has to run through the server process, you get all this information back that produces automatic reports, tables on all those services we just talked about. So it's a very simple process, but in terms of eco, it is the core tool, because every tool feeds off of this. But that's if you want to understand any area. I'd say this because this is a forest industry group, or, or lecture, is that you can use this in forested stands. You can delimit your stand, it'll put the plots out for you with the GPS coordinates, you can go collect the data, load it into the system, and you're on your way. Landscape is a mapping program where we have maps from all the United States on forest resources itself, how much cover is there, how many people are there, we have census data in there. It looks at the risks to forests in terms of fire, insects and diseases, and risks to human beings in terms of air quality and human health. The idea behind what Landscape is doing is we want to integrate all this information into one system so that I can look at any census block in Berkeley or anywhere in California or anywhere in the United States and it'll give me all that information that I just talked about, about what the forest resource is in your area, how many people, what are the risks to the trees, and what are the risks to the people. The idea about handing all this information in one spot is we can make decisions in space about where to prioritize our management actions. So the base one that we use in iTree is show me the underserved areas. Which areas have the highest population densities and lowest tree cover? which gives you an equity of di inequity of distribution of forest cover. So you might target where to plant more trees with that. Or where's the most polluted area where mo most people live? So you might target that area. The question we're running into with many managers is we can calculate the services. They want to know what to do next. Where should I make my management actions? Not knowing that trees are good is enough, but knowing how trees should be in the future to make a better, a healthier environment is what, where we're working towards. And Landscape's one of the tools to do that. Canopy is a photo interpretation tool. If you want to photo interpret anywhere in the world, within a day I can get 1% accuracy on canopy cover and building cover using Google and photo interpretation. Design uses Google. You can go on, sketch, put your home address in, sketch your house and plant trees around it. It'll tell you what the value of your trees on your property. 
We actually have school-based curriculums around design to get kids in the middle schools and their teachers. There's a workbook for kids and teachers to use these tools to get them out in the environment and measuring things about their, their landscape. My tree is similar to design, it's just a phone app. You can go to that right now and punch it. Some information on the tree will tell you what it's worth. Hydro is a hydrologic program. Species is a species selection program, and planting is a planting projector. You can say, I'm gonna plant a million trees over, tell me the benefits over the next 50 years. So what we're trying to do is make this easy technology. There's a lot of science behind it, and only half the work is probably the science. The other half is developing the interface so that people don't get frustrated and trying to, we spend a lot of time pre-processing a lot of data, testing interfaces so people can make, make this easier to engage people in understanding the value of natural resources. Lastly is what we tell people, if, if you're not gonna do anything with the data, don't use iTree. These are some things that people have done across the nation and with innovative strategies to get the information out. They put price tags around trees, around uh, their state capitals to in, inform the politicians of the values of the trees. Milwaukee had a billboard campaign. People go to public meetings. But by having information, they can make an intelligent discussion about the topics. But people are doing all sorts of things uh, that are innovative in trying to get this information out, and it's not us. We're, just, we're providing the calculations and tools for them to help them get the information out and make better management decisions in the future. But we tell people, truthfully, if you're not gonna use the information, don't bother collecting it. Do something with it, because it takes some time and some effort to do that. So that's iTree. Again, if you, you can test those tools out. There's free technical support. Feel free to use it. I'm glad to help you if anybody wants to do that. So let's move on to urban forests. So what are urban forests? Urban forests are defined in any tree within urban land. It doesn't have to be within a forested stand. If it's a single tree in a backyard, if it's along a street, that's part of the urban forest. What this map shows is urban and, urban and community land within the United States. Urban is defined by the U.S. Census as any area that's about approximately 500 people per square mile. And so the U.S. Low, lower 48, 68 million acres, or 3.6% of the land base. Urban and community is the same, plus anything that's politically described as an entity of, of uh, urbanization. So the city of Berkeley would be a, an entity. The city of San Francisco would be a political entity. So in this map, anything with a black line around it is a community. Anything in orange is classified as urban by the census. So you can see there are many communities that have no urban land or very little urban land, and you can see not all urban land is within communities. So we have two definitions of how we look at it. We tend to focus, I'm gonna focus mainly on the urban, which are the more densely populated areas in the United States. So what do we know about urban forests? We know that forests and cities have a common ground. 80% of US urban land is within forested regions of this country. Why is that? What do trees and people need that's in common? Water. We tend to put our cities where people tend to live where water is and forests tend to live where water are. We go into the desert southwest, we have a lot of cities out there, but there is a huge water resource in terms of developing the cities there, but we also don't have as many trees in those regions. So we did an assessment of tree cover across the United States. Tree cover varies. We found that the average tree cover is around 39%, 39.4% for the whole United States with a tree cover within urban areas. So over one third of the average urban areas occupied by trees. These are the bottom 10 states. So the worst state in terms of lowest percent tree cover is North Dakota. What state do you think is number one? Would have the highest percent urban tree cover? It's not New York. It's actually, be, it'll be, because this is a percent, it'll be a small state, if you think about it. As you're close, it's in that region. It's actually Connecticut. Massachusetts was number four, Rhode Island was what, number eight there. So, it, so in Connecticut, in the urban land of Connecticut, almost two-thirds of their cities are occupied by trees. There's a lot of trees in the east, or in forested regions, and it varies, it depends on where you are. So California came in at number 30 at around 31, but California's a very diverse state. You have grasslands, you have forest lands, you have deserts. Uh, in the east coast, it's mostly forested land. So these are just maps to show the distribution of how urban tree cover varies across the United States. So the, the green states are the states with the top 10 percentiles of urban tree cover. Then blue is the next 10, yellow the middle 10, orange, and then red's the 10 worst states. You can see there's a geographic pattern to this. As we move to where there's more forested land, we tend to have higher tree cover within urban areas, which makes sense. Why? Because there's water and there's seed source in order to populate the uh, tree population within urban areas. Which states have the most urban forests in terms of tree cover? 
California makes it in the top 10. So the bigger states with the most urban land and that tend to be enforced in rare areas tend to have the greatest amount of tree cover. So New York, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Florida, Texas, California have the greatest amount of acreages of tree cover within urban areas. So that's the distribution of urban forest in the United States. So we estimate there's approximately 5.5 billion urban trees in that 3%, 3.6% of the land base. So here's a question to test your conception of what an urban forest is. What percent of trees in cities do you think are actually planted by people? It's an interesting question if you think about it, because we have our own connotations. You, depends where you're at. How much? 60. So we're all over the place, 75, 10, 60. It's actually one third. Only about one in three trees are planted by people. Two in three come from natural regeneration. Why is that? Most people live in forested regions, so most of our forest is in urban. If you go in Los Angeles, only about one in, tree, one in 10 trees are planted. That's Los Angeles, though. Most of our people don't live in Los Angeles or most of our cities. Most of our cities are on the East Coast. And what happens if in the East Coast, if I, if I put it this way, why don't I have more trees in cities in the East Coast? In the West, it's because of water. Why is it on average only about 40% tree cover in, in the East Coast? What stops trees from coming in? There's two main culprits. Pardon? Weather would, weather would be good, well it could, because you could have a lot of storms, particularly right now it's going through. But it, it'll come back though. The forest will always regenerate and come back. Yeah, one is impervious surfaces. So about a third of our cities are occupied by impervious surfaces. No matter where you are, the trees aren't gonna come in. What's the other big culprit in the east that's stopping the trees? I'm out doing it almost every weekend. Lawn mowers. If you want more trees, stop mowing. They don't naturally regenerate. And we complain that we don't have more tree cover in cities while I complain while I'm mowing the lawn. Because if, if I stop mowing for a few weeks, I'm gonna get a lot of trees regenerating in. The point behind this is that natural regeneration has a huge impact, particularly because most of our cities are in forested lands. You can use regeneration to regenerate the forest. It might not be what you want, but it will be some sort of forest. It might, might be the pristine oak, it might be a buckthorn invasive forest, but it will be a forest. And that's where management comes in, how to, how to guide that. So people think that they control the urban environment. I think nature controls the urban environment, and we have to work within nature to make the forest better. To illustrate this, this is the influence of natural regeneration in the United States. So we look at the upper left, which is cities that are developed in forested regions, which are most of our cities. The tree cover averages around 40%. You move into grasslands, tree cover averages around 20. And you go to deserts, tree cover average around 10%. So absolute cover drops. What the pie chart shows is how is tree cover distributed within the urban land. About three quarters of all tree cover in cities in the United States come from two land uses. They come from residential lands and they come from vacant lands. That dominates the forest. And you can see when you're in the forested landscape, about 43% of the total cover comes from residential and 37% from vacant. So those two make up the 75. You move the grassland, it shifts. Residential takes up more and vacant goes down. And you move to the desert, residential takes up almost all of it. Why is that? Regeneration. As you move away from where there's enough water, the vacant lands are not populating with forests. So in the east, I can get a lot of forest just by doing nothing. That's what happens. If I stop mowing or along fence rows, trees come in. In the, in the desert regions, we have to bring the water and, and bring the trees in in order to survive. So regeneration is a huge driver, at least for many of our forests, which are developed within forested regions. And then lastly, we know that Urban forests tend to be more diverse. This is species, species richness of cities that we've sampled in the United States. And the average richness in eastern U.S. forests is about 26 species. We can see every one of the cities has more. Why is that? Multiple reasons. One is you have regeneration. Basically what you've done when you built a city is you've put a city on top of a forest if you're in a forested region. So all the natural plants are already there to start with, the natural richness that you start with. Then what we do is we introduce plants from other areas because I want to bring in some flowering crab apple or something else. Or I bring in invasive plants which then escape and invade the forest. So basically what urbanization is doing, as we'll talk about this a little, little bit later, it's changing the composition of the forest because people are making choices which have implications not only for the urban areas, but which will influence the rural areas. So urban forest benefits. These are my top 10 of what I think are the most important benefits. I think, I think air temperature cooling is probably the most significant impact that trees will have on urban environments because 
Temperatures drive so many other processes of transpiration in cooler cities, reduce energy use, reduce air pollution, improve human health. We, uh, trees affect uh, what I call this physiology of people. This, I put this as number two. Basically, if you view vegetation, your body brainwave patterns and chemistry changes, becoming in more relaxed states. So seeing, being around vegetation has direct impacts on the human physiology. They're starting to do more studies on that. Air quality improvements related to removing pollution from the atmosphere, either through the stomates absorbing gases or particles captured on leaves. Water quality has to do with improving water quality by reducing runoff in cities. Greenhouse gas reductions absorbing carbon within the trees themselves and or reducing energy use in cities, which produce carbon. And the other ones are pretty straightforward. So we have all these multiple benefits that are out there. So what we've been trying to do is, through iTrees, assess these, but also try to do national assessments. So we were able to do four of them nationwide. So we've modeled air pollution removal across the country, building energy use, conservation, carbon sequestration by trees annually, and avoided emissions from power plants. So annually, conservatively, we estimate $18 billion that that 39% tree cover within 3% of our land base in the United States is producing $18 billion in terms of either improved human health through air pollution removal, reduced energy, cons energy use, so lowering utility costs, avoided emissions in terms of human health, and direct carbon sequestration in terms of reducing greenhouse gases. So my next question for you, this is how the benefits, the annual benefits of that $18 billion are distributed across the states of the United States. These are the bottom states. So you can see the states that had the lowest tree cover for the most part have the lowest value. In this case, Wyoming gets about $6 million per year that urban forest generates for their state. What do you think the top states are? Pardon? Big states. They are the big states. Well, I, big in area or big in population? California is actually number two on the list. Number one is actually Florida. Four states make over a billion dollars a year from their forests. Florida, California, Pennsylvania, New York. And it's not necessarily about big states and area. It's about big states in terms of population density. Because you have to have the people to receive it. The best county, the county that receives the most benefits from trees in our country is Manhattan County in New York. Highest population density because the trees there impact so many people. If you spread the people out across a large area and it's low population density, you have less of an impact on the number of people receiving the benefits. Florida comes out number one, partly because of population and population density, but also because of energy conservation. You, there aren't many negative effects in Florida. The energy conservation comes fairly large in Florida. So we have this variation, but they're, they're on the orders of millions to billions of dollars per year by states in terms of ecosystem services, just for the four that we know about. There's many that we haven't quantified. So these are the top states, just again, the same map. Green, green are the highest states. So again, it's the biggest states, but also the biggest states in area, but also population density. Montana is a big state, but does not have a, a large urban population. Next, we looked at how is tree cover changing. So now we know we have these forests that occupy 39% of our area. They produce billions of dollars. What's happening? Are we, are we gaining more tree cover in our urban areas? Or are we losing tree cover? This was our question. What do you think the answer is? We are losing pretty much across the board. So we started with 20 cities that we looked at paired image analysis. And this is, so if you look at uh, Albuquerque, the first year we looked at was 2006, then we looked at 2009, you can read all the other states. And this is what it was in the first year. Then we looked at the second year. 17 of the 20 cities had statistic, statistically significant declines in canopy cover. Two had no net change, and one had an increase. The one that had an increase Thank you very much, is where Syracuse, Syracuse, New York, is the only one that had an increase. And that's because I'm out there every night planting trees. <laughs> you know why Syracuse has more tree cover? Natural regeneration. Late 2000s, early 2000s, there was a storm that came through, a Duraco, a sideways tornado, wiped out a lot of the forest. Syracuse has a poor economy. So what happens if I don't develop land and the land's been opened up? Trees come back in. What are we getting? Buckthorn, an invasive European shrub, Alanthus, Robinia, uh, black locust, box elder, a lot of pioneer species. So we're shifting from maple-dominated forest to a pioneer forest because we've opened up the land base. Will it stay that way? If the economy heats up, what are they going to do? The lots that are empty are going to be cleared to put development in. The forest cover will go back down. One of the two cities we actually specifically targeted in this study were New Orleans because of Katrina, 
And that is that effect right there. They lost about 10% absolute, or about one third of the canopy cover was lost because of the hurricane going through in that time. The other was Detroit we were interested in. We picked those two specifically. Anybody know why we picked Detroit? Emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer was one of the introductory points for that insect came in through Detroit. We wanted to see if that insect was having a big impact. It actually had less than normal impact in terms of reduction of canopy cover. Why? Probably because of regeneration. Even though you're losing ash, you're gaining a lot of other trees because if you're not developing a city and keeping up on the infrastructure, forests will come back in. So a lot of the loss from emerald ash borer is being picked up by regeneration of other species. So we looked at these 20 cities and then we said, okay, that's 20 cities. And then we did another assessment looking at the whole United States state by state and try to see what is, is that trend holding. The trend is we are losing canopy cover. So I'm gonna ask you this question, and no one's gotten this one yet, so I'll give you a, a bonus if you can get this one. What state had the greatest reduction in canopy cover between 2009 and 2014? You can see of the 50 states, or the 48 states that we did, only three actually had increases. Wyoming, Hawaii, and South Dakota, none of them were statistically significant. Four had no change, every other state trended downward. Of the 48 we looked at, 23 had statistically significant declines in canopy cover. Who do you think had the worst? It's a really bizarre one. It's actually Oklahoma. It was losing about 1% canopy cover per year during that five year period. And I think that they didn't, uh, we talked to people in Oklahoma and they didn't disagree with that. It, it has to do with development and what they're doing in the cities in Oklahoma. But many of these states are losing one third percent per year of their existing canopy cover. And that's net change. Which means what we looked at is not how many times did the trees go out, but how many times the trees come in also. This is the difference between the two. So even though Oklahoma is losing 1%, it's probably losing more than 1%, but gaining some of it back through regeneration and, and planting of trees. So it would be worse if you didn't have the regeneration. So here's the map of distribution of loss of tree cover in urban areas of the United States. So the red areas are the states with the worst, and the hash bars mean that the tree cover is statistically significant. California actually was, I think that was a zero state. What was it? Yeah. So what does that mean? We're losing about 138,000 acres of tree cover per year in the United States. She equates to about 28 million trees or $96 million out of that 18 billion annually is lost of services that would have been rendered if the trees would have been there and not have gone down in canopy cover. Will the canopy cover continue, loss continue in the future? It could. Uh, could come back also, forests also cycle through time. There's gonna be a big loss in the southeast because of Florence and the hurricane, was it Michael the last one just went through? That forest will come back, but there's gonna be a big hit over the next few years. The, the tree cover loss will not be instantaneous, it'll take like a year or two before it really settles down. After that, it'll start coming back in. But nature cycles, the idea behind this, if we understand the values and what trees can do, is can we guide this to be a better future by making smart decisions? So lastly, I'm going to talk about my top six things of why I think forest industry needs to understand urbanization, or the, ur the top six urban influences on forest industry. Number one is development. It's going to have a huge impact on the forest industry and also on America coming up. So what we did, we looked at growth patterns of the United States, in this case between 1990 and 2000. And what this is, if your county is less than 1% urban land in 1990, it grew by very little land. If it was 9 to 10% urban land in 1990, it grew by about 2.5%. If it was about 50% urban land, it grew about 8% across the decade. What's important about this graph is the slope. The slope goes up, which means cities tend to move always in this direction. As I develop more land, I have more urban land which then means the growth rate's going to accelerate. Because what's happening is, why do we develop, on, why do the ones that have more urban land tend to urbanize faster? Because they have more edge effect. The bigger you are in terms of land consumption, the more we, we build our road, we extend our roads out, we extend our infrastructure out. If you have a small area, there's not much area to extend from. If you have a big urban area, there's much more of an edge effect to develop, consume more of the rural land into urban land. Now what happens is you, you do this until you, you cap out between 40 and 80% and then you crash. Why does it crash? There's no more land to develop. You developed it all, the space has already been consumed. So we're in an accelerated growth phase, and that was between 1990 and 2000. Then we said, okay, let's look at 2000 to 2010 because we had that uh, downturn in the economy around 2008. Think the pattern would have changed? Not by much. 
We actually had a little bit less growth here, still significant growth in this pattern. So what we did is said, okay, let's look at the 20-year average, which is that green line, and let's project if the patterns from our last 20 years continue to hold on decadal patterns, what's the United States gonna look like over the next 50 years? So this is a map of the United States in 1990. This is the actual amount of urban land that we had in terms of percent of the county classified as urban. So if you're in a white county, central United States, less than 1% of the counties are classified as urban. They don't meet the population density of 500 people per square mile. When you move to the maroon counties, which is probably New York, Chicago, maybe downtown Atlanta, I don't think you've met it here yet, that's over 80% of the land's already occupied by urban, urban land. So that's what it was in 1990. It was 2.5% of our U.S. land base. By 2000, it went to 3.1%. In 2010, it went to 3.6%. That's what actually happened. That's where we're at now. Taking that bar graph of the last 20 years of development, this is how the development's going to occur over the next 50 years. We'll go from 3.6 to 4.4 to 5.2 by 2030, 6.2 by 2040, 7.4 by 2050, and 8.6 by 2060. And what do you know in this pattern? The areas that are bad are just gonna get worse. We're not developing new cities out in the middle of North Dakota because they're building off the infrastructure that we already have. So you think that the Bay Area is bad now, wait 50 years. If you think Atlanta is bad now or New York City is bad now, we're getting a pattern of growth like this. So the Bay Area is gonna have massive growth, LA, what we're starting to see is like around Atlanta, center of Atlanta is not gonna grow anymore. It's already, it's already maxed out. You're getting these donut hole effects around cities. We're moving out into the rural lands and consuming more of that land base. We're projected to go from 68 million approximately to 163 million in 50 years. That's a land base larger than the size of Montana that's gonna convert from rural land to urban land. And our urban population is gonna to increase to over 90% put that in perspective, that's 1.9 million acres a year that's coming from a rural land base that's meeting the population threshold to be classified as urban. This, the land area of Delaware is about 1.2. So what does that mean for forestry? The land has to come from somewhere. About a third of the development comes from forest land, thirds coming from ag, and thirds are coming from other land uses. So this rural land, urban land, is consuming the rural land base. By 2060, we estimate about 9% of all tree cover in the United States will be within urban land. So if you're doing forestry in any of these darker green counties, you're gonna have a huge urban influence to have to deal with in terms of number of people and, and land that's classified as urban. Percent of non-forest land converted urban, over the, this is from, 20, from the year two, 2000 to 2050, how much of the rural forest land is gonna to convert to urban land in that 50 year period? In terms of percent, it's gonna be in the Northeast mostly, so these states up here. So in Rhode Island, almost half of the rural forest land that existed in 2000 will be classified as urban land by 2050. Some of the states obviously, have, so California, it looks like it's from one to 5% of the forest land in California will be reclassified as urban. So why, why is that important to forest industry? One, direct loss of forest land. Buildings will take the place. Two, parcelization. If people move in, they buy more of that land. It's not actually fragmenting land, but you have multiple owners owning smaller and smaller pieces of lands of forest. How are you gonna extract the timber? Because there's no longer, or fewer and fewer larger industries controlling that. Fragmentation of itself. Implications of reduced harvest, because now more and more people are closer and interacting with the woods and want to do different things than harvest timber. They might want to do recreation and increase housing density. So there's huge implications of having people live within those forests, and there'll be more and more people more closely associated. Number two, increasing urban population. Around two, 1920, we were about 50% urban, 50% rural. Today, we're over 80% of our population is urban, projected to be not up to close to 90%. Why is that important? There's two reasons why that's important. One is who votes? Trees don't vote, people don't vote. So the policy is made about forest land. If people are more associated with forest and more and more people living in urban areas, the policy decisions are gonna be bent towards the urban land base because those are the people that are gonna be having the greater population votes. Two is, as we become more urbanized, we become less coupled to our rural land base. 100 years ago, most people were living, were, grew up in rural lands. If we grow up as an urban society, 
We're connected to buildings, roads, smart technology. We're de being decoupled from the forest landscape and the agricultural landscape. So the decisions being made on the culture of a society that's being raised in an urban society is going to be different from the culture that it was 50 or 100 years ago. And what are the implications for forest management in terms of people who are making decisions and, and voting for policies related to the forest lands if they're, if they're decoupled from the forest lands themselves and don't understand the value of those forests. So we need to reinstill to that urban population the value of having trees and forests in the nation of itself, not just in the cities themselves. Three is climate change. Climate change in terms of storms, droughts, excessive rain events, excessive dry events, as we see as happening already, how does urban forestry affect that? Well, much of the urban emissions come from, much of the emissions of carbon come from urban areas. If we can design forests within cities to reduce emissions, which we can do by cooling the cities and reducing energy use, if you reduce emissions from the first place by combating the source of the emissions, you can then have reduced, the, hopefully, reduce the implications of climate change in the, in the coming years. Number four, just a few more slides, insects and diseases. A lot of these insects and diseases are come in through urban ports because we, have, we bring the products in from other countries, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, and they're being disseminated by the urban population because people are driving their cars around and carrying these insects through firewood or on their vehicles. So if, you, if you're doing forest management, you can't ignore that urban population who's moving these insects and diseases around because they're going to be spreading them from the urban centers into the rural centers through transportation modes. Number five is very similar to number four, invasive species. We bring these plants in, people move them around, people make decisions to plant trees that they think are beautiful for one reason, we find out they're invasive. So we brought Noe maple over because we wanted to have this plant that's invasive in the East Coast. Uh, decisions we are making as a population are going to influence the forest industry. And lastly, number six, fire. We, People propagate the spread of fire. There's more and more people with more prob probability of uh, ignition sources, but also people are very concerned of how we protect the, the landscape. It's often around protecting the buildings themselves and the people. So how we do fire management can be driven by what the urban pay per population wants in terms of developing this. So urbanization has all, the, all these implications as it, it's because it's going to grow. People are going to have to go somewhere. If our population goes up, we either don't expand outward and we densify our cities, which is not happening. We are tending to often de-densify the cities, if you will, and spread out to the, the rural countryside. So more and more people in association with forests are moving and propagating all these problems that are gonna not only be urban problems, but also rural problems. So I'll end, I'll end with this, that I think urbanization and urban forests are likely to be the greatest forest influence and influential forest of the 21st century. Because people are gonna drive a lot of problems that are seen in the rural land base as the population gets bigger and bigger and as transportation modes move around. A lot of the problems that you're having probably globally are coming from urban centers or can be mitigated through better management of urban centers. So with that, I thank you for your time. A couple of points that I was thinking about. Um, uh, people who live in cities uh, are mostly decoupled from the wild areas and the forests. However, I think most environmentalists are people who do live in urban areas and want to save the habitat for wildlife and so forth, whereas many of those who live in the rural areas are big gun totalers and, uh, and uh, they go out and, and they shoot the wildlife and they, they exploit the, the, the wild areas in that sense. But I suppose they, they value the, uh, the existence of forests as well, uh, even though they, they may not care about the, uh, the preserving the wildlife as much. So I think there is value in people who live in urban areas. They, uh, for example, I, I contribute to the Nature Conservancy organization, and, and they are, are very active in, in wanting to preserve and buy up areas to pres preserve uh, and to make a contigu contiguous uh, wildlife habitat and so forth. So um, uh, not all hope is lost because of urbanization, uh, but I think there's a, there's a great, uh, great um, influence in people. Yeah, and I agree with you. I don't, think, I don't think hope is lost. I think if we can, if you think about this, it's 85 to 90 percent of our people live in this urban areas. The more we can educate them, this is why we're trying to move to education with an eye tree, of teach the next generation of the value of nature 
not only in, in the rural lands, but in the urban lands. And the more they understand that, the more people will support Nature Conservancy because they understand the value of having the trees. If we, if we discount nature as having no value, it becomes discarded. So we cut trees down and we do, we just develop everywhere. But if people understand the value of nature, they'll make more informed decisions and hopefully smarter decisions. And our next generation of managers are the kids that are in school today. If they can come out understanding at least the value of nature and when they make the management decisions, at least it's in the background they have some institutional knowledge about the value. And I, because that base where a lot of decisions are gonna be made are from that urban population. A lot of money, if you want to support nature conservancy, is probably gonna come from these urban centers and businesses related to that. So I agree with you totally on that. Hi, so I, thought your slide on the diversity index in the urban forest was really quite interesting. And I've wondered about, you know, given things like the emerald ash borer, Dutch elm disease earlier in my career, and um, when I've seen more recent tree plantings, there seems to be still a push to a great uniformity in the species that we put out there. So is, is that's just my anecdotal impression as I'm looking at what species we're planting and you know, reforesting urban areas. But is there much of a push to diversify or are the obsessive compulsive disorder sufferers like me that feel all the trees have to be the same on a street winning here? I think there is a, a, um, a push to diversify. I think the problem is the ability to diversify is limited because the stock is not there. So what do people go? They go to Home Depot, Walmart, or wherever and buy, and what do they see? Well, I see a red maple, I see crab apple, or whatever they have. So the choice of picking up a Dawn Redwood or something that might be, would survive in your area is not in the market base. So we need, and there's talk about this, trying to get the industry, it, it, it's supply and demand and get sort of a catch 22. If people are gonna buy it, they're not gonna produce it, but if you don't put it out there from the buy, they're never gonna buy it in the first place. So there's a push to try to get the industry to supply more diversity of species so we can get it out there. But if you go and these cities have to buy contracts, you have to have enough trees to put in the ground. It's a limited palette to choose from, so you tend up getting the same, it's self-fulfilling. It worked in the past, so I'll keep doing it. We need to break that paradigm and say, okay, we need to diversify and try new things. And there's a push about that, but it's trying to break the economic cycle of doing the same old, same old, I guess. So uh, we all, any, anybody who's a voter here has an interesting opportunity coming up. We have uh, trees being cut down by the tens of thousands, healthy trees in the hills here. And it's part of a program a lot of people have been fighting for a decade and a half. Trees are cut down and then pesticides are applied. So this measure FF, um, the East Bay Regional Parks District measure, sounds all nice until you really know what's going on. They've been part of that, and um, from what we can understand, in calculating about 40% of that Measure FF money would be being used to kill healthy trees and use pesticides, simply because some people have wrongly believed that eucalyptus started the fire in, the, in 91. That's not true. It was gas lines. It was houses and gas lines, and then at some point, anything will burn. So anybody who wants more information, you can look in the voter booklet and then look at the information, look at the websites of the organizations opposing this. You'll get a lot of information. I was just gonna ask, as far as energy goes, like coal and oil and renewable energy and other sources of energy, um, how does that play a role in tree survival or, or the demise of trees? Ooh, what do you mean in terms of how we consume it in, in urban areas or? In in terms terms of, look at does like uh, emissions, uh, you know, uh, okay. oil emissions, uh, um, what is it called, fuel? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, if, if, if you have high concentrations of anything, you'll probably kill a tree. So if it gets high enough, if you, if, if you spill the oil in the soil, you're going to kill the tree. In terms of air emissions, most of the time the trees are fairly hardy and can survive. Um, if, if you see trees starting to die because of air pollution, you've got a problem. Not for the trees, but for humans, because the concentrations have gotten pretty high. For the most part, plants will take like nitrogen and sulfur out of the atmosphere and use it as a fertilizer. It doesn't harm the plants. The only one that's really harmful 
is ozone itself, smog, will damage the plants. So what they're, uh, it'd have to be high enough concentrations to, to actually perform some damage or slow growth downs, but ozone was a, is a funny one because some plants are pretty much immune to ozone, some are fairly sensitive to ozone, and what you'll see is a stippling on the bottom of the leaves under high ozone concentrations. But they are still removing it when they gas exchange, so that the idea is for those emissions of energies, first rule is reduce the emissions in the first place. Stop it from getting out of the tailpipe or the power plant through clean energy. After that, once it's in the atmosphere, there's two active surfaces on the world that remove pollution. One is plants, the other are human beings. We breathe in and out. The idea is to have the plants breathe in and out when they're transpiring and exchanging gases to reduce the concentration so people can breathe in less. So it would depend on the concentration and what the pollutant is. But for the most part, unless it's high concentrations, the plants should be able to tolerate it. Most plants should be able to tolerate it, at least under ambient concentrations. Uh, in, in Germany, every town or city with a population of greater than 3,000 is required to have an urban forest not tree-lined streets, but a unit of ground in which trees are planted and managed for a variety of benefits for that particular town or city. Uh, do you know of any examples in the United States where cities actually maintain urban forests? That's an excellent question, because this is a problem we have when we talk to urban. We talk urban forestry in, ur in Europe. It's a forest within an urban area. In the United States, it's all trees within, within the urban area. So we have forests within urban areas, but for the most part, we usually call them parks or vacant land, and we really don't manage them. The only one that I know about that actually manages forests, I think some communities in Maine actually own forested stands that are part of their city, but they're outside the city, but they own, they own and manage those forested stands. Within cities, yeah, Cook County Forest Preserves in the Chicago region actually has forest management. But there are, even, even in some of our parks, we are probably managing forests, although we're calling them parks. But we're not in the same state as like Europe of saying, let's establish what we call, quote, forests and call them urban forests, except for probably Cook County is a good one. Thank you, I would have forgotten about that. I used to live there. Yeah. Arcade. Arcade has it? Yeah, so there are some cities, but. Yeah, so I'm totally convinced by your argument of the value of the urban tree and you know, that we should be planting more and they have all these, <clears throat> co-benefits that go on with them. But then you talk, when I talk to city planners, you know, there's, they have a, sometimes they have a preference for green infrastructure because it doesn't have all the trade-offs of a tree. It doesn't grow into the, you know, doesn't grow up and doesn't wreck the sidewalks, doesn't grow into the sewer lines and, you know, a nice, and I've seen some nicely done green infrastructure. And so how do we, I mean, what, how do you respond to that kind of argument? So define green infrastructure in your context because I might have. It'd be like, I've seen ones where they have a nice solar panel, they have a little swale with some green, you know, they're not trees, but some green plants. And so it's shade, it's doing some energy. Um, well, it's producing it's, shade is probably a tree, but uh, at least but no, for. It's, it's literally, a, it's like literally like a panel, you know. A panel of. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a roofed area with a solar panel and a little sway, like a. Okay, you know, so you're you're talking also blue or whatever the. Uh, it blue, the, yeah. yeah okay. And they got, and they're also they're also dealing with water runoff, so they you know they also do some of that work on. Yeah, water so runoff. the green infrastructure often in design is usually swales or curb cuts to allow the water to infiltrate the soil. So it's all, all a lot of the green infrastructure is about, often about water containing water. So I mean trees will pump out more water to dry the soil. So the argument would be, to me, is two fact besides. This is what we get, we get into this often is we tend to be myopic and try to solve one problem, and, and, but if we use trees, you solve many other problems. So if I, if I get away from, let's, having, let's say, low-lying vegetation in the swale. So the swale's fine, the water runs in, allows to, we want to get the water into the soil. No, no doubt about that. By having greater biomass and greater leaf area, you're storing more carbon, you're having more gas exchange. So it's actually, it's all about the leaves pretty much. So what you're doing is by giving up the trees, you're giving up some shade, the upper level shade, and you're also giving up leaves that gives more gas exchange at a higher level in the atmosphere. Is there a cost to it? Yes, but there is a benefit? Yes. There's a cost to anything. There's gonna be cost to the green infrastructure. So it's not the cost of trees and the cost, it's, it's the comparison of the two, how much more would it cost to have that tree? Because if you didn't have the tree, you still have to mow, or you'd have to have the green infrastructure. There's still gonna be a maintenance. So you wanna look at the differential and the cost of adding that tree. But the trees can be a 40, 50, 100 year lifetime proposition if you do it properly with low costs and they maintain themselves if we don't screw the system up. Where the green infrastructure is gonna take a lot of intensification of, of management almost annually because of things clogging the drains and keeping those grasses that might be annuals or perennials that don't survive as well. 
So I would argue that trees provide a greater benefit per unit area than any other landscape, vegetative landscape out there. Uh, hi, I'm curious about that one app you mentioned that measures the values of trees. What information does it take and how does that use that information? For which one, I'm sorry? Um, the one that gives a monetary value on trees. The, the iTree tools, you mean? Uh, yes. So if you want, most iTree tools, landscape, you don't have to do anything because it's all preloaded. It's, it's a, it's a mapping-based system. But for MyTree, which is the phone app, Design, which is the Google Maps, or, or Eco, which is the main core, you would have to measure species. You're basically telling us what the tree is. We want to know information about what species it is and what size it is. So you would measure diameter and circumference and measure some parameters about the height of the tree and whether it's dead or alive. They're pretty simple measures, only about seven measures you have to take. Unless you're doing building energy, then you have to take nine, you have to take two other ones, which is how far away and what, dis what direction is it to the building, because it has to orient the tree around the building. So they're basic measurements about crown parameters, tree health, diameter, and species. And the hardest thing, hardest thing to teach anybody is species. You can teach diameter, you can teach measuring crown parameters, but teaching species is difficult. And the better you are at estimating species, the better the model will be. Sometimes people just say hardwood, or they'll say ash or whatever, so we have to make some sort of conglomeration of averages to come up with something that would fit for that, for that group. So it's pretty simple. I mean, the iTree app, if you could just Google it, it's like th three measurements. Diameters, you don't have to do height for that one. It's just species, diameter, and is it dead or alive, basically. And what, I argue you have to measure the crowns because the leaves are based on the crown. If you don't measure the crown, like in the simple apps, we use computer programs to estimate the crown parameters based on statistical equations. So it's a, it's a modeling procedure. It's better if you measure it, but something. What we deal with in developing iTree is simpler is better for the user's point of view, but simpler is often sometimes too simple, and they want it, they just want it, basically I think people just want to say, I live in Berkeley, what's the answer? I live at this address, I don't want to measure anything. Well, you have to measure something. So it's walking this line of how much you need to measure to get an accurate answer. Yeah, but people like, I'm the same group, we're inherently lazy. We want instant answers. Yeah, I just have a, a different view on the measure FF. I'm a member of California Native Plant Society, and 40% of the money for FF is gonna to go to stewardship of natural resources and helping shoreline parks adapt to rising sea levels. And we are working with them on fuel management in some of the parks that have endangered pallid manzanitas. And they do uh, eucalyptus thinning and use extremely small amounts of pesticides when they do cut down a eucalyptus tree. Okay, I'll stay out of that one. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm, a, I'm an urban planner, also working on sustainability in a big East Coast city, and I am interested in, you talked about the compelling economic impacts of forest services in cities, but what resonates particularly? Like, what have you seen that's, that's been an effective um, messaging or tools that different, uh, I don't know, has been useful in actually turning campaigns into action for conservation? I, I, think, I think groundswell actions, having not scientists come in, but people from the community who want to instill to their politicians the value of trees it has been fairly effective in many communities. I think the price tag idea has been fairly successful. Um, I think it's, I, I personally do not like putting dollar values on it. We try to do the you know, tonnage or gallons or whatever it is, but people always want to know the dollar value, which is, I mean, you, can, you probably understand the problem with doing that. But I think when we move it away from dollars and tie it into you know, asthma and things that are more relevant, things that tie in and not necessarily money, but deaths and, and uh, allergies and things like this that tie to human health, I think human health is where, where we're trying to move the messaging to. Whether it's from air pollution or reduced temperatures and thermal stress on people. And, and, and quality of life is another one too. And that's a hard one to, to quantify because it's, it's not a physical measure. It's, a, it's a, maybe a social measure in some ways. But I think trying to get it down to things that resonate with people. And for, for planners and politicians, I think the dollars resonate. For people, I think it's, I, to me, there are three sensible, sensible, in, in that you can sense them, uh, services that trees provide that people recognize readily. Uh, one is aesthetics, difficult to quantify, but they get it. Two is wildlife, because they can associate trees and they have an, they have an attachment to wildlife. And the third is temperatures. They can sense coolness when they walk underneath the canopy of the trees. 
So those are things that human health, if they understand the bridge between trees and human health, but you have to take the story back to what resonates to the people in your area. And it, it might be whatever the FF is, I don't even know what that is, but something that you're dealing with locally and how trees tie into that, it could be something else that, health that always resonates with people. So when you said what resonates, and I think reson what resonates with politicians, all of the attempts to put valuations in terms of what's the margin that the urban forest adds to the value at the parcel level, uh, those, you know, they're speaking to the individuals that actually own, which decreasing proportion of households, but um, do you find that is not uh, a useful argument anymore, that the aesthetics and so forth are more, I mean, you always wonder about the values, right? Like Leopold said in, yeah. in the land ethic, when we have value to something like the song of a bird, we try and invent a monetary value to go along with it right. to justify the fact that we liked it. So I, I think, so what's the question? I think the marginal value is not resonating or? impacts not a pervasive argument or persuasive argument anymore with homeowners about the well, I think I, 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 I would think that real estate you kind of mentioned that. I, I didn't because I'm against real estate values and I'll tell you why. I, I think it does resonate with people but I argue that it's not a value to people. It's a value of transaction when I go to the sale but I argue, we're doing a paper on this right now, is that if my land values go up because of trees, I'm paying taxes annually because the value's now gone up. I'm paying more taxes into the system. I'm being taxed to have nature. It's inverted that we should have a tax incentive that reduces taxes to have nature because nature provides a public good. It's an externality but we're being taxed for that public good. So people don't think about that, I guess inherently when they buy it, but if I pay $10,000 more for my house, I'm now paying that percent more on my taxes annually until I go to sell a house. So it's only a value at the point of transaction. It's not a value that's annually accrued to me, which might be like temperature or other things that I get every year back. So, but I think it does resonate with people because it's a big value. You're talking with 3% of the house maybe on average, the property values go up, but what good is that to me? It's good when I go to sell. I want to buy a property with no trees on it, at the lowest possible price, and then before I sell it, plaster it with trees so the value goes up. But in the interim, if I buy it with trees, I'm paying for it, but I'm paying annually for the tax system. So, but it is a good point. It is, it, that would resonate with people, the property values. But it's probably a, a, a bad argument to make in some ways. But it'll, it'll work. So I want to ask a two-part question that's very much on our minds about training of future generations. And the first part is, have you seen good examples or any advice on how to get more education about these issues into, say, School of Public Health? Or so on the other side, sort of bringing the value of trees into people who care about health. And the flip side is, any advice or experiences you've seen of how to change the way we educate our students to incorporate what you're speaking about here? We haven't gone much into public health. I think that's a way to go. I think public health is getting that because there's more and more articles on public health and trees, so I think it's getting there. I don't know what they're teaching because I haven't gone through that program. Um, our focus right now is not necessarily college. Though we do have courses for, you can teach iTree in colleges. There are some curriculum for that, but we're trying to get into the, the high school, middle school. Uh, simple tools. Uh, one of the things we're doing in, in my tree, which is the phone app, It'll be out later this year. We're putting pins on it where you can pin trees. The idea behind this was to get, there was a grant for fourth graders, to get school kids out of their classroom and into the woods, but they can take their technology with them. They can measure the trees, pin it on the phone, and put it out. It'll then go onto a Google map, and then you can query which schools. The idea was to have schools compete against each other. Who can produce the most values or map the most trees? But it allows, it keeps the technology and gets them into the woods. So I think that's, we, we need to be innovative on technologies to engage at least younger kids. In terms of college curriculum, I think, I haven't been here for 30 years, so I don't know exactly what your curriculum is, but same, same problem that we have, because I, I, well, I, I teach somewhat at Syracuse uh, School of Forestry there. I think we need to move more towards encompassing all services of, that the forest provides, and not traditional forest, and we, we do this, but there's a whole new avenue of 
ecosystem services and values provided that we need to have more emphasis on to, to grab that next generation. I think you want to hit the urban centers. They're not, we were just talking about this earlier, forestry as a term may not resonate with urban people because it has a connotation of forestry. But you changed on what, forestry and environmental studies or? Ecosystem management, so that would resonate more, but still ecosystem is a concept that's sort of foreign to, to many people. You're trying to find that word that would draw people in from city centers, and it's about making the environment better. So environmental health would be one, but trying to teach them that as we manage a forest and keep it healthy, we can have timber and, and cleaner water, but have all these other things, and we, it's about smart designs. Because it takes 30 to 50 years, the decisions we make today, are going the next generation is gonna pay for them. How do we make smart decisions and try to be all-encompassing and, and move curriculum towards that, which is more integrative across curriculums of keeping the trees healthy and understanding all the services provided by trees? Is there any last question or two? Just a technical question. Uh, with your iTree app, how do you expect people, especially the younger uh, you know, middle school kids, uh, to give you an accurate measurement on the size of the tree? I don't think it matters. Whether the right, they'll be close enough. I, I mean, it, garbage in, garbage out. If it's a six inch tree and they put eight or 10, the fact that they're out there measuring and getting an answer, they're not making a policy decision on it. They're basically just getting out and learning about the value of trees that trees you know, sequester carbon and remove pollution. So I don't, there are training modules to show them how to do this, to, to measure diameter and things like this. We have uh, YouTube videos and all these things to show people simple things, but really at that level, it's not like it's forced inventory they're using to make policy decisions. It's, it's a kid in the woods, and getting the kids in the woods is the goal, and having them learn about ecosystem services. So I would, I mean, you can teach that, it's in the manual how, how they would measure it, but if they measure it inaccurately, so you, you don't need the uh, information from iTree for any policy decisions? Oh, we, do, we do use some of our policies because we, we look at the data that comes in, and if it's good data, we'll use it. My fear about pinning trees with middle school kids is, I, I, I call it the Bart Simpson, Bart Simpson um, phenomena, I guess, or some drunk college kid gets on or starts pinning trees in the middle of Lake Michigan. We can't be the police of this public policy. I mean, what we're gonna do is allow people to do likes and ask ones to be removed that are obviously wrong, so there's some peer review quality checks amongst the users themselves, but we can't police the pinning when it's out there. So if they put a 10 inch tree and it's six inches, it'll be pinned as 10 inch, but at least gets them out there doing something. We probably wouldn't use the public domain data for any sort of decision, except for one of the things we're adding on there are insects and diseases. Do they see any signs and symptoms of something? We might mine that data set to look for certain patterns in geographic areas to see. We're seeing a lot of ash trees that are having poor health. Maybe we send the forest service in and do some mining of that whether it's right or wrong, we look for patterns, but we're not gonna use the data to make, I don't think, make any policies. Final question. Hi, I live in a homeowners association. We have about 300 trees. We're struggling to manage with Excel. Will iTree help us with that? You have 300 trees in Excel? Yeah. You can import from Excel directly into iTree, so if you, the only thing you have to do is match the species up because <laughs> scientific names, but will it help us manage those trees? It'll help you, it'll inform you what the value of the trees are and what the risks are to the trees. We're not to the management stage yet. We will be there within three to five years because we're building all that landscape map layer and the field data will line up together. So we're gonna start giving management recommendations based on the, so the problem is when you give me a homeowner area, I don't know what your problems are because I don't know where you are in terms, that's why the landscape layer will tell us what the, what the is it high fire risk, is it high UV radiation, is it high pollution? We're gonna mine the mapping data to then inform the people in that area. And we'll also look at the insects and diseases in your area. So if you have emerald ash borer, we wouldn't recommend ash. But we're building those systems to come together so that when you load your data in, it'll go to the other databases from the other tools and then say, okay, given what you, we know about your area, here's what the computer says you should do. Uh, oh, that type of management. No, we, we are not. We, yeah, we are not a tree, you could use that, but we are not a tree management uh, software system, and that was deliberate, because when we built this, the, the managers didn't want us competing, a federal government agency competing with private industry, so we deliberately do not do individual tree care maintenance records, because there's many people that do that, and you can just do it in Excel. You can add it into iTree, <laughs> you, can, you can pin it in iTree and add values to it, but we're not gonna tell you when to prune or keep management records. The great thing is we have a reception. 
so you can continue asking your questions. So if you join me in thanking David for a wonderful talk. Thank you.